Good morning and welcome to the 11th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2019. Item number one, decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take item three in private this morning? Yes. Thank you. Item two is Audit Scotland's Future Work Programme. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning, Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Fraser McKinley, Controller and Director of Performance Audit and Best Value, and Anthony Clark, Audit Director, Performance, Audit and Best Value, all from Audit Scotland. I'm going to ask the Auditor General to please make an opening statement. Thank you, Convener, um, and thank you for the chance to brief the Committee on the Work Programme for 2019-20 to 2023-24. As you all know, public services in Scotland continue to face unprecedented challenges in terms of both public expectations and demographic change. Public bodies are working hard to deliver more preventative models of service delivery that address inequalities and uh, improve long-term outcomes. This is not easy, obviously, but it is essential if we're to have sustainable public services in the longer term. At the same time, such services are increasingly being provided in new and innovative ways through public, private and third sector partnerships, and the lines of accountability are increasingly complex. This creates risks which need to be properly understood and managed. We think that most public bodies have so far coped well with these challenges, but they are facing increasingly difficult choices. As auditors, we see increased risks in relation to shortfalls in skills and capacity and financial pressures in public services like the NHS. These are only likely to increase in the medium term. The briefing paper sets out for you some of the key public sector risks that have informed the performance audit programme, the planned part of our work. It's worth stressing that I keep these under review to respond to developments such as the impact of the UK's decision to leave the European Union and other policy developments as they emerge. An important aim of the programme is to help the committee scrutinise the impact of significant areas of investment and government policy, such as the expansion of early learning and childcare, the proposed order of strategic capital investment and the programme of work on Scotland's new financial powers. But we also consider a host of other factors, including the implementation of government policy, areas like improving educational outcomes, supporting people with mental health problems and tackling child poverty are all examples of auditing the effectiveness of policy implementation. This is also an area where audit can support the committee in its post-legislative scrutiny role. I share the committee's interest in cross-cutting areas like digital and workforce planning, and you'll see a number of audits on those issues. And I also aim to ensure that the audit work reflects the concerns of the people who rely on public services, for example, through audits of health and social care integration. The briefing paper sets out the proposed five-year rolling programme, with Appendix 1 setting out the likely scope of performance audits planned through to 2021, and Appendix 2 outlining the longer-term programme. There's obviously more room for flexibility and change in the longer-term programme than in the work that's now well underway. The briefing paper also summarises how the work programme reflects the cross-cutting themes from the committee's business planning day last September, and how I've responded to the feedback that the committee helpfully gathered from the subject committees this year. I'd welcome feedback on the work programme from the committee, together with areas that you'd like us to consider for future work. And as always, the team and I are happy to answer questions. Thank you very much indeed, Auditor General. I'm going to ask Alex Neil to open questioning for the committee. Okay, I, I, I've no dispute at all with the, the work programme itself, Auditor General. I have two questions, really, um, which relate to possible additions. Um, I welcome some of the cross-cutting work, obviously digital being a good example of that, workforce planning uh, clearly uh, is a major area, not just in the health service but elsewhere. But one of the uh, cross-cutting themes that we have had is the level of remuneration at the high end in the public sector. I mean, a report came out last week, for example, in relation to local authorities. Um, and one former chief executive recently um, stood down, uh, was earning £200,000, including pension contributions, uh, while low-paid workers were being sacked because of the cuts. Um, and uh, if you look at the Scottish water bonuses, for example, uh, it really does beg some questions about, you know, are we really getting value for money at the top end? Uh, now, you know, having been in business and having run government departments, I know the need to attract talent. 
but uh, it doesn't strike me particularly um, that that is justifying some of the excesses uh, in the public sector. There's a lot of public concern, particularly at a time when people are suffering major cuts in services. People are being made redundant, uh, usually low-paid people being made redundant. And they see these excessive salaries and remuneration packages at the top end. Is it not time we had a wee look at that? It's a really um, important question and, as you know um, well, a complex one. I think the, the people who tend to attract the sort of media attention you're talking about are the people um, whose salary is at the top end of the range, not just in their organisation but across the public sector. Um, and um, I also think, as you say, there is that important balance between being able to attract people to do the jobs while making sure you're not paying more than is needed for that and that it's in line with um, pay for staff as a whole. Um, I think I, we um, recognise that there is more transparency about pay and reward in the public sector than there is in the private sector, and that's a useful starting point. Um, I think we can uh, think hard about how we use our routine reporting to provide a bit more of that transparency and perhaps analysis to you. Um, but I would say that one of the things I'm concerned about in the work that we've reported to you already is, for example, the difficulty there is in attracting um, chief execs of the right number and calibre for NHS boards, um, where pay has been quite constrained over recent years in line with public sector pay policy. Um, and that's making it harder to attract and keep the people needed to do what are very big and complex and challenging jobs. Um, so if you're content, I think what we can offer to do is to take the question away and think about how we might either do some straightforward analysis to provide to the committee to follow your, your own interests with government about pay policy and the way it works, um, or to inform further work that we do um, to narrow that down into something that is a, a, a useful piece of work for you that starts to answer some of those questions. That would be helpful. I mean, I do recognise in some situations the uh, top salary isn't big enough to attract the, the right calibre of persons. So, but but I think if we were coming at it systematically and could prove that that was the case, then it would make it more acceptable to people that they have to pay over the odds as they see it uh, to get the right person. Uh, and obviously it's linked in, for example, one of the reasons we can't find enough chief executives of NHS boards is there's just far too many boards. Uh, you know, it's about the management structure of the NHS, particularly now we've got the joint boards uh, on top of the health boards. So a lot, of, a lot of new boards have been created, but none have been abolished as a result of that. So that, that ties in, obviously. Um, so it is a complicated issue, but I think it's one where there's a lot of public concern particularly at this time of cuts, particularly when the cuts are falling on people who can least afford it. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of perceived unfairness and, and wastage. So if you can look at that, that would be extremely helpful. Uh, the second one is more specifically on Scottish water, leaving aside the issue of the bonuses. Um, I know, obviously, Scottish water has got its own commissioner uh, in terms of regulation and so on. But in terms, and, and you know, there's a, I'm not getting at Scottish Water, but it seems to me it's a very significant organisation, it's a very important organisation, and yet we've never, in all the time I've been in this committee, I've never seen any report on Scottish Water um, and where it fits in, looking at its investment programme and uh, its modus operandi. I mean, I think some of its recruitment practices uh, are, are perhaps not in line with what I would expect of a government agency, if I can put it that way. So, and it might, and I realise obviously Scottish Water, um, there's an interest in local government, obviously in Scottish Water, because of this uh, division of responsibility in, in, in terms of water and sewage services. But is there not a case for, and it might be the need to do it jointly uh, to have a wee look at Scottish Water because we've never had a fundamental look and I mean it's now been up and running as an organisation for some considerable time. Uh, my predecessor um, Robert Black reported on Scottish Water um, as a performance audit I think around 10 years ago so it's not true to say there's never been one but certainly not in my time as Auditor General. Um, it's important to be clear that I appoint the auditor to Scottish Water and that audit takes place annually um, and is reported in the normal way. You're right that I haven't added a report to it primarily because on the whole I think it is a well-managed organisation. Uh, but I know Fraser and the team have been thinking about um, this question in response to um, your own interest last year. So I'll perhaps ask Fraser to pick up where we've got to in that thinking. 
Thank you, Auditor General. Yes, you, you raised this last year, Mr Neil, and I think what, what we're looking at is exactly what would be most helpful for you. It is a, it's, it, I'm, I always hesitate to use the word unique in these circumstances, but I think Scottish Water is probably a unique organisation in, in Scotland. Um, that, that might um, lend weight to your argument for having a look at it. It also means we need to think quite carefully about the nature of that piece of work. Um, and what and what the scope is? Is it about the you know the value for money and the performance of the organisation? Is it about its how how you know the whole setup of Scottish Water as a, uh, as, a as a body in Scotland and how the water industry works in Scotland, which is obviously different to elsewhere? Um, so we've been working with uh, and speaking to the auditors um, about that. Um, what what we can absolutely do is is write back to you to let you know where we get to with those discussions to confirm um, what we might be able to do. At the moment, I think our thinking is it's more likely to be done through the annual audit work that Caroline described. Um, Caroline obviously has powers to report on the back of annual audit reports to you under the Section 22 powers that she has. Now, historically, they've, they've tended to be used for things that aren't going that well, um, but they don't need to be that. Um, so that might be a, a reporting option. And obviously, we've got the performance uh, audit reporting route as well. So if it's OK, convener, we can write back to you uh, in, uh, in the next couple of months, maybe and let you know how we plan to take that forward. OK, that's fine. The, the, the other one that I think needs a bit of looking at is the CalMac and CMAL. I, I mean, obviously, uh, we've seen the controversy over the ferries contract with the Ferguson's the shipbuilder, but it's not just about that, although that does raise a lot of questions about procurement of ferries. And, you know, we are, we've got a dire shortage of ferries that work in Scotland, uh, which is an historic thing. Uh, but also how the relationship was between CMAL and, and CalMac and suppliers and, and so on. Um, and again, it's not something I've seen, you know, any detailed work being done on uh, for a long, long time. So, well, we did the ferries report two years ago, I think, 18 months ago. Um, now, you're right to say... Services it was rather indeed. than yes. the company and the, the modus operandi uh, of the company and the relationship between CMAL and CalMac and so on. So you're absolutely right. It was primarily about ferry services. There, there was quite a lot in the report about how all of that worked because we had to set out the complexity of, of the governance arrangements around that. Mr Neil, you're absolutely right. Um, what I would say is on the back of that, we are uh, following up that report through the Transport Scotland audit. Transport Scotland is the sponsor um, division for ferries um, and we're following up the recommendations in that report. Given uh, the things you've just described, that's something we are keeping a really close eye on through the Transport Scotland audit. Uh, and as Caroline said, we have, you know, we always keep the programme under review and if we think we need to bring forward something more on ferries and in particular the role of those organisations, then, then obviously we can do that. I mean, this this procurement exercise with the ferries, I think, is something that, as an audit committee, we should be much more interested in because clearly, you know, it looked as though the situation was getting near resolution and it doesn't appear to be the case. And I think there's a lot of questions to be asked about this. Now, I'm not sure if the Transport Committee is looking at this in depth, but maybe we should check because I think this is something, as a committee, it's very justifiable for us to be looking at this because there's a lot of money involved. I think we can find out if the Transport Committee are looking at this, but um, Mr McKinley, can you come back to us on that as well? And sure. It's also worth saying, Convener, just briefly, that through the audit of the Scottish Government, um, the Auditor General reported on, uh, and indeed I think did a great job in making more transparent, the, the support that Government were giving um, the, the procurement of those ferries uh, for uh, Ferguson Marine. So, so, so we are doing a bit to bring some transparency to that, uh, and we can certainly have a think about what more might be done. Good. Okay, thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mayor. General, your, your report or programme of work includes work on the EU withdrawal, and obviously there's so many uncertainties about that, the scope and timing and so on is probably a fairly big imponderable. Um, do you have any detail on the likely nature of that work? Because to me, and maybe I'm blowing it up bigger in my mind than it is, it, it seems to me this could be fairly comprehensive. It could be a, a huge piece of work that could nudge other things out. Um, you're absolutely right that so far the challenge has been the not just the complexity, but the uncertainty and the way in which the likely um, outcome has been shifting, not just day by day, but hour by hour on occasions. Um, like the Scottish Government, we've been... Um, 
monitoring the situation on a very regular basis within Audit Scotland um, and having weekly briefings at management team on the impact on the bodies that we audit and on potentially our own ability to do our work. Um, this week, given the uh, agreements that were made just before Easter, um, we've agreed that it's time to step back and to, to do some more detailed scoping on what the piece of work referred to in here might be. We, we published a briefing paper last year, about a year ago, which set out, um, based on our audit intelligence, what the impact was likely to be on the bodies that we audit from the Scottish government body, from the Scottish government itself outwards, um, picking up on the three big areas of um, EU funding, people, and regulation. Um, I think people found that quite helpful in helping to direct conversations with audit committees about what the implications were locally, and auditors found it helpful in building up their own understanding of what the risks were and what the impact might be. We're now, uh, we've asked the team leading this work now to step back and just do some more detailed scoping on what we might do this year and what the longer term picture might be. But it's clear that EU funding to particular parts of Scotland and particular policy areas is something which w will become important um, almost whatever the outcome is unless Article 50 is revoked. And as Fraser was saying just now, very often us putting that transparency into the public domain with our independent um, view of it can be a helpful step forward. But the team is scoping what we do and again we we can keep the committee briefed as that develops. Do you have a contingency plan in terms of, uh, depending on which scenario comes about, uh, you may have to drop parts of your programme in order to prioritise the EU withdrawal? The, the way the programme is put together um, is built around the presumption that, that something may come up at any point and that our response is not to come back to you on the SP, SCPA and ask for more resources in, in normal circumstances, but to flex and rearrange what we're doing. In this case, I think um, our approach is a bit more two-pronged. We've kept some resource deliberately reserved that we can use to look directly at the effect of EU withdrawal. Um, and we are also um, working on the assumption that the individual pieces of work already in the programme may be affected by it. Um, so, for example, NHS workforce planning. Um, we know that some parts of the NHS rely heavily on um, staff from other EU countries. Um, we can uh, look at the way in which the government and a NHS boards are responding to the changes as part of that work, the same in relation to social care. So I think it may become a strand in the work that's already here where that's appropriate, rather than meaning that those pieces of work are swept away and something else comes in instead. But we keep it under review. Thank you, Convener. Just briefly to add, uh, Mr Beattie, I think when, when we established the, the programme only as recently as December, we were still expecting to have left the European Union in March. So this piece of work, I think, originally was designed to capture the immediate impact of that, which is why it was in 1920. The reason I mention that is that I think there, there may be a good chance that it's probably, it may not be 1920, it may slip back a little bit, obviously, depending on, on what happens uh, with the whole Brexit debate. But as Caroline says, the team are scoping up some options for us over the next couple of months, and, and that'll help us decide what we're actually going to do, and we'll keep you posted. I can understand all the uncertainties around it. Just a couple of other quick questions. You know, we, ha we highlight through your reports, we, we receive your reports that highlight issues uh, and pressures in the public sector in Scotland. Are there any, given your links and so on to the rest of the UK, do you, ha do you have any feel for how these pressures are being addressed south of the border? Because the pressures are hugely greater there and they've always had to come up with innovative solutions and so forth. Is there an indication that the public sector in Scotland's you know, learning from that and adapting? I think the answer is probably that it depends. Um, in some areas, there are much more similarities between public services and much more ability to do that learning than in others. Um, there are obviously, as you know better than we do, um, some uh, political tensions that can get in the way of that learning on occasion. Um, through all of our work, we do aim to look for good practice, not only elsewhere in Scotland, but across the UK and globally. Um, that's a big part of what Fraser's been leading for us over the last couple of years. Fraser, do you want to say a bit more about it? Uh, certainly, thank you. So, um, as it happens, Anthony leads our international work. I'm not sure if we count England as international, but um, but uh, we, we do look south of the border. And I think in, in some places, particularly in local government, Mr Beattie, I think we, we keep very close tabs on what's happening in councils in England, um, as you say, their financial pressures are even more acute than the north of the border, and, and we keep very close uh, to what's happening there. But we have very close relationships with the National Audit Office in London, uh, for example, and we work very closely with them on areas of, of mutual interest. So, so routinely, when we are doing an audit in Scotland, we'll be looking to colleagues in the NAO to see if they have 
uh, have things that we can learn from. In terms of the extent to which um, Scottish public services learn from other places, I, again, I think I would agree with Carly, and I think it's probably mixed, I think it, and I think it depends, um, because some models of public service delivery are quite different. The health service in England is set up very differently to the health service uh, in Scotland, so you need to be careful about making too many comparisons. That said, I think we would also be quite challenging of, of an assumption that there is nothing to learn just because um, the model of service delivery is, is different and, uh, and we would always encourage uh, you know, Scotland to learn from other places. If anything, I think I see more examples of them learning from abroad, from New Zealand, Canada, maybe parts of Europe, um, as much as they do in the, within the UK. Antti, I don't know if you have anything to add from the international perspective. Fraser's quite right. Um, we see quite a lot of evidence of people looking to New Zealand and, and other parts of Europe for good practice, particularly around prevention and outcomes, where there's a well-developed approach to thinking about planning for outcomes in, in, those, in those places. And we also have links beyond the NAO to the Canadian Audit Foundation, which gives us connections with good practice examples from, 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 from North America that we can pick up in our performance audit work. I'm pleased to hear that, that, that this exists because obviously the reports coming to us, we don't really see that side of it. You know, going on in the background. Just the last question, internal audit. You know, I come up with that periodically. Um, are we expecting too much of internal audit? Do, do, should there be a review, or have you considered a review of uh, how internal audit functions? Because, as I've said before, we have we've had multiple cases where internal audit have done their job, ticked all the boxes, according to their contract or whatever, but a problem still develops. Now, we've heard before that, you know, internal audit's not there to detect fraud and all this sort of thing. You know, they are a gatekeeper in many ways. And are local boards, for example, really aware of the limitations on internal audit and that they need to perhaps have other strategies to detect issues that come up? You're absolutely right, and um, you, you know that we've produced a briefing for this committee about what role internal audit plays as part of the overall con controls and risk management within any organisation, whether it's the government, a health board or a council. Um, they're an important part of that system, but they are only one part of it. Um, when internal audit is, is the problem, um, or when there are problems with internal audit, we do report that. Um, so, for example, my Section 22 report on the Scottish Government last year highlighted that at that point the Internal Audit Directorate wasn't meeting all of the requirements of the public sector internal audit standards. Um, and that does have an impact both on uh, Scottish Government's risk management, but also on the bodies which receive services from that directorate, um, quite a number of them across particularly the central government sector. And I will continue to, to, do, to do that, to report in those terms about the Scottish Government's Internal Audit Directorate and where we see um, failings in other bodies. Um, it's something that every external auditor is looking at routinely every year. Um, on balance, I don't think that an audit of internal audit would add enough value to justify the resources that we would need to put into it. But if the committee wants to take evidence from the Scottish Government about its own role, um, both in providing that leadership through its internal audit directorate and supporting bodies in their own um, development of their governance arrangements to back up guidance like the onboard um, guidance that's available to them, we'd be very happy to support the committee in doing that. Based on your various uh, audits, are you satisfied that uh, the local boards and non-executives understand the limitations of internal internal audit because I can imagine sitting on a board you'd be thinking oh we've got internal audit they're, 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 they're protection against anything that might go wrong they'll pick up anything whereas that is not the case. I, I think it varies a lot I'll ask Fraser to come in in a moment because we do a fair amount of training and support for non-exec directors um, as part of our continuing work. Um, I think a broad generalisation, but I think I'd say if you've got a board that's working well, the non-exec directors tend to know both what value internal audit can add, but also to recognise that it's not a panacea, that it can't uh, compensate wholly for failings elsewhere in the governance system. And where you've got a board that's not as effective, all of those things tend to be not as effective together, and that's clearly where the risks are. Fraser, do you want to say a bit about the work we do in supporting non-execs and what that tells us? Yes, yeah, so, so on a couple of levels, we, we always have a slot at the um, non-executive director induction events that Scottish Government runs, so we come along and talk about the role of external audit, but we also take the opportunity to talk about the importance of internal audit and indeed the differences between the two. 
and also locally we quite often do sessions uh, for audit committees in particular about what they should be looking out for uh, and that's part of the part of the role that external audit teams often play i mean i think our my general sense of it, bearing in mind that it comes back to the point Mr Neil made earlier, there are something like 227 public bodies in Scotland, I think, all of which in, in some way are audited by the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission. Um, and I guess it's it's easy to forget that the ones you see coming here tend to be the ones that aren't working so well. Actually, the vast majority of those, I think, are working fine. Uh, I, think, um, I think audit committees in the main do understand their role, understand the role of internal audit and external audit. And as Caroline says, we know that because the assurance work that, that happens in all of those bodies every year through the annual audit work. So that's not to say that it couldn't be better. And indeed, um, in a different part of the world, the Accounts Commission published a report a couple of weeks ago uh, about internal controls, which wasn't just about internal audit, but looked at internal audit amongst other things that, that are important uh, when it comes to ensuring that internal controls within councils are, are sound. Um, and as Caroline says, if, if external auditors have a concern about the capacity or, or the ability of internal audit to do a good job, then then that gets flagged and tends to get escalated. Um, so, so yes, I think that's I think that's how we engage with it on a on an annual basis. Okay, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, convener. Uh, Caroline, I wonder if I could ask you um, where do you think we are in terms of the overall um, performance improvement agenda for a number of years? We've had some fairly detailed and hard-hitting reports from you, and we are going to get a number of hard-hitting reports, I'm pretty sure, over the, the coming years. And as you know, for a number of years at the committee, we've always been asking, how do we close the circle in terms of improvements within the public sector, the embracing and adoption of standards and so on? How I think we've made some good progress over the years, but there's always more that we can do. I know that. But what's your perspective on it? And do you see across the public sector landscape an improvement in performance as a result of the audit work that your organisation carries out in this committee? Carries out? Yes, I mean, you know that we take seriously the need to make sure we don't just produce a report that gets um, attention here in the committee, maybe attracts a headline and then ends up attracting dust on a shelf. That's not what we're here for. We're to improve the way public money is spent. Um, and often the way we'll do that for a, a large and significant area is to keep coming back to it. So we report annually on the NHS in Scotland um, for health and social care integration. We've produced two out of a planned series of three reports that will look at the way that's developing. Similarly, on early learning and childcare, we've produced one report. Uh, at the turn of the year, we'll produ be producing a follow-up that looks at the way um, not just our recommendations have been addressed, but the progress that government and local authorities are making in putting in place the staff and the infrastructure they need to do it. And I think, um, I think on the whole, we can see improvements. Um, a couple of frustrations, I think, for us is, um, first of all, it can take a long time. So this committee has spent a lot of time looking at digital projects that haven't gone well. Um, those tend to have a long tail. So we'll be reporting on a couple more um, that haven't gone well, but that have got roots going back four or five years. Um, and for us to be still seeing those come through, even with all the investment that the government is making in new skills, new approaches to getting that right in future, um, is frustrating to us, as I'm sure it is to the committee, and things take time. Um, the other challenge I think that we see is the ability for government to learn across its many responsibilities and the many bodies that it needs to work with. Um, so we still report from time to time, for example, on government being very clear about the outcomes that it wants to achieve, for example, in relation to um, improving health and social care, but not having in place the measures it would need to know whether it's doing it or not, and therefore whether what, what it's spending, what it's investing is effective. Um, and one um, obvious example of that is that um, almost 10 years on now from the uh, establishment of the 2020 vision for health and social care, we still know much less about what's happening in primary care and social care than we do about what's happening in acute hospitals. And that makes it hard, not just for us, but for government to know how well it's going and to make sure that it's um, doing more of the things that are working and less of the things that aren't. So on balance, I'd say we are seeing improvements, um, but not in a, a consistent and systematic way across the whole picture. Do you, do, you, do you think, therefore, that there's, there's not enough evidence from whatever organisation you look at to demonstrate to, to both you and to us and to the public that improvements, lessons have been learned and improvements are being made? Do you see that circle being closed more than in 
than you perhaps did in the past? I, I would say more, but not, not consistently enough. I think, I think if the outcomes approach is about anything, it's being very clear, not just about what are the outcomes that you want to achieve, but about how you're going to do that. You need to have a real plan for how you expect to improve those outcomes, how the money you're spending, the people working on it, are going to make a difference. In some areas, we see that working pretty well. In some areas, there are, there are still gaps. And unless that planning is going on at the beginning, the, all of the benefits of the outcomes approach not all of the, the benefits are going to be achieved, and I think that that's an area where the committee could have an impact. We're currently finalising a piece of work that aims to give the committee a basis for inquiring into that a bit further and also provide some support and guidance to the government and public bodies along the lines that you were asking about um, a moment ago, um, and I hope that will be something that will just add to this debate a wee bit. Good. And on the, the issue about embracing standards, recognised international standards, do you see resistance to that across the, the landscape of DC, much more of a willingness to embrace. Uh, every time I see a report from you, I always look to see if the said organisation has adopted and embraced whatever management standard, be it IT, development or construction or anything. And do you see a willingness to engage with these standards and to adopt them? Um, the best example probably is digital, where those standards are, they exist and they're, they're well known and well understood. Um, I think um, what I would say is that for the large organisations and particularly for the government itself, for the Office of the Chief Information Officer and, and the um, infrastructure around that, they're well understood and well used. Um, where we see problems are with smaller organisations that don't understand what they're getting into when they start a programme off. The committee's seen an example of that recently. There's another report coming through shortly where a project started a while ago without that clarity. I think that the variability still exists and the risk is probably in smaller bodies or projects that are, that are a bit older. Mm -hmm. And if I could just ask a question on, on one of the specific pieces of work that you're planning to carry out on the enabling digital government. I wonder if you could tell us just a, a little bit more about what's in that and uh, is there anything in that on looking at data, data anal analytics and the, the lack of regulation that, that's actually in there about how data is actually used? It's not covered, I believe, convener, using the GDPR regulation. I think, and there's there's big issues there about how data is actually used by companies, corporates, or whoever. Will you will you look at that aspect, and will you also have a wee look, if possible, at how organisations are applying the GDPR regulation? I think, in my view, some some experience I've had, convener, is that uh, uh, organisations are using it as a shield to prevent scrutiny and accountability. For example, convener, a, a recent example where I was trying to find out the, the owner of a dilapidated building to ask them to clean it was prevented, was, was not disclosed to me, and GDPR was used as a shield to prevent that. And I don't think that was the purpose of GDPR at all. So there are, there are issues in there about security of data and whether people are actually using that to prevent scrutiny of, of whether it's in the public sector or not. I'll ask Fraser to come in in a moment. Um, you'll see that the Enabling Digital Government piece is due to be published shortly, um, and we're actually um, finalising it at the moment. I think it's fair to say that that doesn't focus primarily on the GDPR elements, but Fraser can give you a bit more information about our thinking in that area. Um, so I was, I was about to say the same thing as, as Caroline, Mr Coffey, and the, the Enabling Digital Government audit is specifically looking at the role of the Scottish Government in ensuring that um, digital government is being is being rolled out effectively, which has been a really interesting area actually about what what actually is reasonable to expect Scottish government centrally to do in terms of of, of enabling digital government. So that's the focus of that piece of work. It won't really get into GDPR. In in response to your earlier question, I'll speak to the team about whether there's anything we can say about the use of standards as part of that work. We're seeing the team, I think, just next week, Caroline, so we can. Um, we can feed that into there. Um, the GDPR thing is interesting because, of course, there is the Information Commissioner who who is responsible for the regulation and and, uh, and looking after GDPR and how that's being implemented from a personal basis. I think I recognise the circumstances you've just described. And um, what I can say is that we'll pick up that conversation with the Information Commissioner because it's there's something here about ensuring that we're all clear about who's who's leading and who's responsible for that. So very happy to pick that conversation up with colleagues in the Information Commissioner's office. Okay, thank you. Just to add to that as well, I think it's an interesting point you raised, Mr Coffey, but of course we're doing our post-legislative scrutiny on freedom of information, and as 
GDPR is an exemption, it may be coincidentally that the committee does cover this um, under post-legislative scrutiny, but I certainly think it's worth looking into. Do you have any further questions, Thanks Mr Coffey? Yeah. Okay. okay, Liam Kerr, please. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning. Uh, I think Willie Coffey does raise some important points there, and I'd like to just develop one particular area, and that is around the part of the problem that we often see with these reports is that uh, the government's bringing in policies based on, as you said, Auditor General, perfectly uh, understandable outcomes, desirable outcomes. Uh, but because there's a lack of baseline data, it's very difficult for anyone, let alone this committee, to assess the success or the progress from whatever that baseline should have been. Uh, so some of the examples that I think this committee's looked at would be the mental health, the children's mental health, the uh, ferry services, the road equivalent uh, pricing. Uh, it, it, it rather seems somewhat endemic. So is that something, is that a line of inquiry that you will be looking into this lack of baseline data and what's being done? We look at it as part of pretty much every um, performance audit that we carry out. Um, as you say, unless you know um, where you're trying to improve from, having an outcome in mind and a, and a goal for where you want to get to isn't very helpful. It's an aspiration rather than a plan and something that you can um, invest in and monitor your progress against. Um, I'm not sure that looking at it as a, as a thing in itself is helpful because it is so variable across the piece. Um, as Fraser said, the things that come to this committee are often the things that have not gone so well rather than the things that have gone well. But I do think there's scope for more, uh, a more systematic approach in government, building on the real success, the internationally recognised success that is the outcomes approach, the national performance framework in legislation, to make sure that in every instance they're being as rigorous as they are in the best. So to take one example, um, if you look at the patient safety programme in the NHS um, and elements within that, such as healthcare-required infections, the government has been really rigorous in knowing, not just nationally, but in every healthcare, um, every hospital, every health site, what the starting levels of infection look like, um, having a plan for how they intend to bring them down by um, involving staff in thinking about what would make a difference here locally, and then monitoring day by day what's happening with it. And you can see the results in the numbers coming down. That's not to say that terrible things don't still happen from time to time, but across the country we know we're better off because of that rigorous approach. We don't see the same rigour being applied to looking at what might be needed um, to make sure that older people who are just about managing in their own homes um, can be helped and supported to stay there safely rather than getting into that vicious circle of hospital admissions and gradually getting less and less able to cope. Now, it's more difficult to do it for older people and, and a whole system of health and care, but the principles are the same. Um, we keep reporting on that, and I think the committee's got a really important role to play in pulling back and looking at what government's approach is to making a reality of its national performance framework, um, and in a sense doing that on behalf of the parliament as a whole. We sometimes reflect that this parliament doesn't have a, a public administration style committee looking at those cross-cutting lessons about the way the government does its business. Um, and I think this committee can play a part in some of that work, um, both on the back of our work and, and, and in relation to your post-legislative scrutiny responsibilities. We're very happy to talk to the committee about how the work we've already got on the stocks can help with that and how we can produce further analysis, further information from what we do that pulls together some of those lessons to help you take that a step further. Uh, and is that, just on that last point, the answer to the question, how do we ensure that government can extrapolate from, let, let's say, the, the good practice example that you gave in the NHS uh, across to other projects? Is that something that we need to work with you so that the committee can understand how to get those lessons where they need to go. I think that could have a real benefit in um, helping to improve the quality of, of policy making and implementation across the piece. What we find is that often when we've reported on something, there's a real improvement on it. So I hope that when we report back to you on early learning and childcare, there has been some progress in, in putting that, that baseline data in place and the measures for how it will improve. But that, that doesn't always translate into confidence that when we move on to a new area of policy, that we're going to see the same learning happening. And I think this committee is very well placed to ask government how it intends to make sure that those improvements, that the lessons that are learned in one place, are fed out and picked up right across its business. 
Thank you. Uh, finally, briefly, and just like uh, Mr Coffey, I'd like to go very specific. Are you going to do anything on the AWPR, the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route? Um, we have nothing specifically in this programme at the moment, um, but as Fraser said, we do audit Transport Scotland every year, um, and Transport Scotland is the, the sponsoring body for AWPR plus a number of other major um, capital investments. Um, we also support the committee in your scrutiny of the uh, infrastructure investment programme, um, and we'd be very happy to look at how we can help you um, to use um, either of those uh, vehicles to scrutinise Transport Scotland and the government in relation to that big project. If I'm frank, we could spend all of our time looking at big projects um, in transport and uh, other big investments. We have to be selective, but we'd also, we're also keen to look at how we can help the committee um, follow up your own interests through the information and work that we already have. Thank you. Sorry, Fraser just, McKinley. Very briefly, um, the report that the Auditor General and the Council Commission have on the stocks on the revenue financing of assets, um, which is due to publish uh, August, September, I think, uh, this year. Um, I mention it because AWPR is one of the case studies we've looked at. I also mention it because I'm managing your expectations. It is not an audit of AWPR, um, but you will see that as one of, I think, six case studies we've used to look at how um, non-profit distributing and the hub models have, have worked across the country. So it gets a bit of focus in there, but as I say, it's not uh, an audit of how that project went as such. I mean, we'll see what comes out, but I suspect that area is one where uh, we'll be very interested I mean, on, on the financing and, and the revenue. So. Yep. When is the next Transport Audit due out, Auditor General? The 2018-19 accounts is just getting underway now. Um, it will be published in the autumn, um, and I'll consider whether a Section 22 report would be helpful to the committee as part of the normal process. Thank you. Bill Bowman. Thank you. Can you a couple of areas to ask about. The first one is on your um, rolling work programme. Just to ask about a couple of uh, items there, a wee bit more understanding. In 2021, you've got one that says Commonwealth Games Legacy. What, what would that be? Um, I'm going to ask Fraser to pick that one up on the basis that I won't be Auditor General by 2021, <laughs> so it would be presumptuous <laughs> to pick it in. <laughs> Games. It seems a long time ago. <laughs> it does. And, and, and the idea, uh, really, Mr Bowman, is it, we've done a series of these, so we did one um, before the Commonwealth Games to, to check on uh, how that how the organisation was going. We did one kind of immediately afterwards, and we'd always planned to do, as the name suggests, a legacy one. So given that the um, objectives around the Commonwealth Games, as well as running a successful event, was about legacy, was about supporting communities, and particularly in uh, the East End of Glasgow, but not only, in other parts of Scotland too, that piece of work is looking at the extent to which those wider objectives of the Games have been met or not. Spending a lot of time on that because you know, if you find something's not done, it's a long time after and you probably won't be able to do much about it at, at that time. So it, it, it will not be a massive audit, I don't think, and it's one of those that if there's nothing to see, then that's quite quick. Do you know, we get, we get to that point quite quickly. Um, but having said that, I think given that it was a significant amount of public money that was spent on it, given that it was predicated on uh, on making a long-term difference, uh, we think it's uh, quite an important thing to look at. But no, it's, it's not It's not going to be a massive piece of work, I don't think. And looking in 23-24, um, and, and I don't know how Auditor Generals hand over to each other whether they're like presidents, they write letters to uh, to tell them what to to look at. You've got support to rail services. What, what, <laughs> what, what would that be? Um, the, the thinking... Just pulling back a little bit, the way the whole programme is put together um, obviously isn't dependent on the whim of me as Auditor General. It's based on a lot of development work that goes on within Audit Scotland um, and on um, uh, engagement with the people whose views we want to inform this, politicians, managers, service users and so on. Um, it seems to us that rail services are a really important part of Scotland's infrastructure investment and indeed continuing revenue support, the, the overall transport plan at the moment. Um, there are big improvements going on uh, to the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement uh, Programme, as well as uh, questions about the ScotRail contract and the new sleeper um, arrangements that are coming into place. And I think the thinking is that that might be a good time to take a step back and look at that in the round. As always, the later years of the programme um, can flex and change as circumstances change, but it's a, a placeholder to say we think there's something that would be worthwhile at that so point. So support in that context means money from the government to Indeed. the... Yes. 
uh, and given that you know rail services are in are in boxes almost every every day, but what's coming up imminently on on rail? Uh, I think the, the the answer again is the Transport Scotland audit is always looking at the um, the amounts of support that are provided in different ways to rail, to ferries, um, to uh, roads investment, um, and that we will uh, keep under view the. Uh, issues that we think need to be audited and those that should be uh, reported onto this committee as part of the routine work. And so taking up Liam Kerr's point on the AWPR, I mean, will ScotRail just be a paragraph in that or would you have a, a significant section on, on the, the problems that they're having? Yeah, it's, un it's mm -hmm. unlikely to be a significant section, Mr Bowman. I think that's fair. And I think the, the, the real benefit of bringing this to you is to get a sense from from the committee about what might be, you know, more urgent than than the, the program suggests. So, uh, the reason we have a, a rolling program and we review it every year is so we can flex things and bring things forward and move things back. So, if if the feedback is that something around rail would be would be of interest to the committee sooner rather than later, then absolutely we can build that into the thinking for uh, for the refresh this year. Well, it would be for me anyway. Um, just to then move on to what Alec Neil was saying about um, top end pay. Uh, I know in, in the private sector, if there's a problem, the CEO is often one that goes first. Now, that's not often what you see here. We you know, occasionally see a, a CEO perhaps uh, leaving. Do you look at any form of how CEO or chief executive appraisal is done in the organisations you look at? Um, it tends to come up only where there is a problem in the, in the way that you've described. Um, so... I think if you think back to the work we've done on the SPA, um, it became clear in that that, um, first of all, the former chief executive hadn't performed, um, hadn't supported the authority itself in the way that we would have expected, um, and that the um, authority's options for dealing with that were constrained by the way in which they had or hadn't appraised his performance. Um, in those instances, we'll report that to the committee as part of what we've seen there. Um, it's difficult to see how we would be looking at that as a, a theme across the piece, but it certainly does become an issue where we're looking at what's, what's happened in the instances of a particular organisational There problem. might be a question as to whether it happens at all. Yeah. Fraser, Can please. I come in here? Yes. So, so I, I'm just reminding myself that in paragraph 22, Mr Bowman, of our, of our briefing note to you, we, we mentioned the fact that one of the areas of our programme development activity is around public sector leadership. And, and that list of things that we have in there under programme development are things that we recognise as being really important, but we're not quite at a stage yet of how we figure out how to turn it into an audit, I guess, would be the simple way of putting it. So, um, and, and indeed many of these will then lead to, if you like, proper fully blown performance, audit, uh, performance audits later on. So that seems to me an obvious place where we can bring that into scope. I think it's an excellent question. Uh, as you say, just even a baseline of, um, do they all happen? Um, I'm, I'm interested... Uh, equally in things like what do um, chief executives' objectives say? What are what are the kind of systems of accountability and incentives for chief executives of um, different public bodies? Uh, are we are we in in objectives sense and in terms of their appraisal sense, ensuring that they are doing the things that we say collectively need to be done? Yeah, uh, I think is, start, is, yeah. is fascinating. So so we'll pick that up as part of that program development work, which in turn might might turn into something else and, and and as we say in here while we don't tend to um publish these in a sense obviously more than happy to share those with the committee yeah, thank you thank you auditor general um i'm just conscious that our, our job in the public audit committee is to follow the public pound but something that i've become increasingly concerned about is where large chunks of money are given in grants to um to bodies, often commercial companies, that don't fall under your jurisdiction to audit, understandably so. But um, some examples I would give um, would be the £45 million uh, that was given to Ferguson Marine uh, a few years ago, um, I think the, uh, under the former First Minister, and then the £46 million that was uh, given to uh, Prestwick Airport, um, I'm really wondering, um, 
if you have any jurisdiction at all to really look at these sums of money um, and assess their uh, value for money for the public purse and really what has happened to that money. Um, second question would be when the government, I think both of them were loans, expect to get them back, if any of that money has been repaid and if the government is, is getting a suitable return on those investments. Uh, you are absolutely right that where um, government or other public bodies are funding um, third parties, private companies, third sector organisations, I generally don't audit those bodies and therefore I can only look through the lens of the, the bodies that I do audit. As Fraser said earlier, um, one of the things that I think we've been quite successful in in Audit Scotland is, is making that much more transparent. Um, so when the government bought Prestwick Airport, we reported on that through the Transport Scotland audit and reported it to, to this committee. Last year's Section 22 report on the um, Scottish Government included the support that had gone to Ferguson Marine and to Burnt Islands Fabrications Limited, um, not only bringing that into the public domain in, a, in, a, in one place, but also making a recommendation that the government itself should have a framework for when it provides that sort of funding, um, what its overall capacity is, how it's monitoring performance and what its exit strategy might be. We'll continue doing that. But I do think the committee itself has got an important role in asking some of those questions directly of government or the, the body that's providing the funding. Um, we can continue to provide the transparency, but they're often questions of policy rather than um, questions of sort of audit problems that we need to highlight to you. I'm very clear that the government is able to provide support to companies in the way it has been doing, but there are trade-offs in doing that. Um, there's an opportunity cost to it, um, and the committee is well-placed to be asking those policy-related questions questions about um, what it's intending to achieve and how that's working out in practice. Okay. Can I ask you um, another example of non-commercial practice? And um, I use for an example, and we, we've discussed this uh, before, um, the, the V&A in Dundee. So we've seen a significant amount of public money go towards uh, the V&A and a great project and justifiably so directly from the Scottish Government but also indirectly from the Scottish Government through local universities and other entities. Um, are you seeing uh, an increasing amount of this happening where government money is being funnelled towards projects that don't come under your jurisdiction to audit such as uh, V&A Dundee? They to be um, the more unusual projects like v and Dundee um, has been. Um, but you'll notice in the programme we've got some work underway at the moment on city deals, um, and they're often very specifically um, funding sources, funding from a number of sources, UK government, Scottish government, local authorities, universities coming together. And one of the questions in that piece of work is absolutely about the governance and the accountability uh, for the money that's going in and the impact on local communities. Fraser, do you want to say a bit more about that? Um, about the city deals thing particularly? Or, uh, no, I mean, I think nothing much to add, convener. I think the, the, the it's quite unusual, I think, where you get, certainly in, on that scale, obviously public bodies are are giving money to, to third sector or private sector organisations all the time in a sense. I think we are we continue to be satisfied and I can speak for the local government end of this discussion as well in terms of councils giving money to, to other organisations that the powers we have allow us to to get assurance on how that money is being used um, and importantly I think that even if it is the case that whether it's Scottish government or a council uh, or any other public body is giving money to a project or to a third party, it's their responsibility to ensure that they can track how that money is being spent. They don't just hand it over. So that, and that's where we do still have you know, answer, powers and control. Your answer, Mr McKinley, and, and the Auditor General's touch on governance and accountability, which leads me to my final question on this. Um, that governance and accountability in terms of these grants, both commercial and non-commercial grants being given, um, rests, I think, with Scottish Enterprise. Um, I, I might be wrong, but I don't see any audit of Scottish Enterprise in, Sco in the rolling work programme. Has there been one over the last few years that I just can't recall to mind, or is there one planned? Or um, I, I, Worth saying again, first of all, there's an audit of Scottish Enterprise every year, which gives that baseline of assurance. Um, we did some work on their role in uh, supporting economic growth three years ago, um, yep. and there's a number of um, programmes in here, particularly the work on uh, skills, um, which uh, Scottish Enterprise play a big part in. Um, but I think the assurance we can give you is, first of all, that we audit Scottish Enterprise every year, and, and that sort of um, 
part funding to third parties is always an important thing that the auditor is looking at and we can report that to the committee if there are issues that we identify and also as Fraser said that we have VNA Dundee on our radar as a watching brief and if uh, concerns emerge there we, we can use our powers to report on it at the moment um, we don't have that concern and we can pick up the transparency point in other ways as I think we did in the section 22 report on the Scottish Government again last year that's a big wide-ranging report but it's a useful place for us to be flagging these things that we know the committee's interested in that perhaps aren't transparent otherwise that the committee is then well placed to follow up thank you very much uh, final question also something i've raised with you before on uh, drugs um i think the i think audit scotland is looking at this in form of a briefing is that correct sorry when i say drugs i mean the um awful and tragic circumstances that we have the highest number of drugs deaths uh, here in Scotland in Europe and I think Audit Scotland were doing some work as to perhaps why that is and if services are working correctly to prevent that. Can you say a little more about that please? Yes, we're doing a, a, a briefing on drug and alcohol services, um, which to an extent is following up a report we carried out a number of years ago um, across Scotland. Fraser, do you want to update the committee on where we are with that? Certainly, Ed. So we're we're basically putting the finishing touches to that briefing now, convener. So um, so we're very happy to share that with uh, the committee in the next month or so, if that would be helpful. That would be great. Thank you very much. Do members have any further questions for? Audit Scotland on their work programme. Can I thank you all very much indeed for coming to give evidence on your work programme this morning and now close the public session of the committee. <laughs>